if the universe looks like it's fine-tuned for complex life, maybe there's a fine-tuner. Maybe it was fine-tuned for life. If you didn't have the electromagnetic force, you would have no bonding between chemicals. You would have no light, and the list goes on. So you need all these sorts of fundamental principles have to be in place in order for life to occur. Wipe out one of those principles, wipe out one of those laws, no life. Okay, so he's saying that there's only one unique way for life to exist. This, of course, is purely speculative creationist tosh. To demonstrate this point, I'm going to go to the microscopic level of molecular dynamics. Shown is a molecular dynamics simulation of the bee sting protein called melatonin. These simulations are routinely used and are very useful for the interpretation of experimental results and the predictions of microscopic behaviors of such systems. It's a well-established and mature field of chemistry. There's just one thing. There is no gravity whatsoever in these calculations, nor is there any gravity whatsoever in the more detailed quantum mechanical calculations. Gravity is about a thousand billion 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 times weaker than the electromagnetic force. It's an irrelevant factor in the molecular forces which determine molecular dynamics, which is why you can leave it out of the equation altogether. It's also notable that life is remarkably robust to the absence of gravitational fields, functioning almost as well on the Earth as it does in microgravity. Put simply, there is no reason whatsoever why you couldn't get life functioning perfectly happily in a universe with no gravity. There are just four forces that we are aware of. That's gravity, the strong, the weak, and the electromagnetic force. Now I've just shown that gravity is not necessary for the functioning of life. Further, a recent paper has suggested that a universe without the weak force would look largely indistinguishable from our current universe. So half of the forces that we know about are not essential for the functioning of life. So much for the creationist statement that everything needs to be perfect for life to function. But now let's move on to the simple deceit of creationists. One example of this fine-tuning is the force of gravity. Imagine a ruler divided up into one-inch increments and then stretched across the entire universe, a distance of some 14 billion light-years. For the purposes of illustration, the ruler represents the possible range for gravity. Yep, you always need dramatic music if you're going to play God and choose a new gravitational force constant for the universe. However, if you want to play God, as the creationist seems intent on doing, then the limits for the gravitational constant are zero in infinity. However, you cannot put an infinite number of finite-sized inch strips together in a finite distance. It's impossible by definition. Like, say, for instance, a square with five sides. What the guy is describing is simply mathematically impossible. In other words, the setting for the strength of gravity could have been anywhere along the ruler, but it just happens to be situated in exactly the right place so that life is possible. Now, if you were to change the force of gravity by moving the setting just one inch compared to the entire width of the universe, the effect on life would be catastrophic. Well, in fairness, the animation was neat and the music was fine. However, it's still pointlessly speculative mathematical nonsense. The creationist demonstrating that he doesn't understand mathematics is Lee Strobel, author of such books as The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, and The Case for a Creator. The title of these books and his gesturing are unsurprising given that Strobel's highest degree was not in physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, or any other scientific discipline for that matter but law. Yep, that's right, the creationist fielding the case for creation is a lawyer. Now at this point an inquiring mind will be asking, what is a lawyer doing making predictions about diddling with the fundamental force constants of the universe, when he has no real scientific understanding of the one he currently lives in? In this sense, Strobel's mathematically impossible speculation on the gravitational constant has about as much academic credibility as a burger flipper lecturing a brain surgeon on cerebral aneurysms. The principal difference between lawyers and scientists is that scientists gain their reputation, or track record, based on what they can establish from the physical evidence and logical deduction. 
However, for lawyers, truth is an irrelevance, as the criterion that determines a successful lawyer is their ability to present a successful case, not their ability to establish truth. Although obviously it helps for those who harbour a conscience if the two coincide once in a while. You want answers? I think I'm entitled to You want answers! I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! But let's take another look at this case for a, a fine-tuned universe. There's about 75 cubic kilometers of life on Earth, while the volume of the Earth is approximately 1 trillion cubic kilometers. That means that, by volume, the Earth is approximately one billionth a percent life. For me, this device is an example of fine-tuning. For this object, each of the thousand billion 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 atoms are arranged, sorry, fine-tuned, for the purpose of human transport. Now, if you found a rock of comparable size and found a fleck of iron in it the size of a pinhead, that's approximately the equivalent volume fraction of life on Earth, would you conclude that the rock was fine-tuned for the purpose of being a car? So why would you conclude that the Earth is fine-tuned for the purpose of life? However, it's better than that, as the creationists in this video go on to argue that we are the only life in the Milky Way. Fantastic! The volume between us and the nearest galaxy is about 5 times 10 to the power of 58 cubic kilometers. That means that the creationists are happy to argue that something where you find one part in 10 to the power of 58 that works means that that object is fine-tuned for that purpose. Now, for the creationists to call this a fine-tuned universe for the purpose of life is like taking a billion Earths and finding a single iron atom on one of those Earths and then concluding that these billion Earths are fine-tuned for a purpose. In summary, it is deeply unconvincing to try and argue that a universe which has essentially no life in it is fine-tuned for the purpose of life. Wipe out one of those laws. No life. Maybe there's a fine-tuner. Maybe it was fine-tuned for life.